think there's a possibility, because governments are involved in these schemes too, right? not just corporations, that a government could use its aid money to favor certain IOC members' favorite development projects, <laughs> specifically in Africa. I've heard that one floated in the past, and I am not yet convinced, because this wonderful system at the IOC, where they're there, they're there to the mortician, you know, gets the wax out, and governments can't remove them. And nobody can remove them unless we photograph them taking money, in which case the IOC may have to uh, suspend them for several days. <laughs> no, I, th I hear this said, I don't think it's the case, because if they're corrupt, they're going to pick up the money from somewhere because they're going to send the word that they need money. Um, you're no doubt thinking that Canada, of course, has foreign aid programs, and they will have lobbied your ambassador in country X will have gone round, will have had the IOC member in and told him, you know, what a wonderful job Canada's For doing. Sports programs. Yeah, but it's not going to have any effect. Why should it? You can't, you know, it's not a recall system. The, the member can say, well, that's a great country you've got in Canada. He could be putting more money in. Oh, we will, we will. And of course, then they can steal it. Because so often the aid donors don't say, I'd just like to see a full of accounts, receipts, and uh, you know, independently audited books. But that won't win them the vote. Um, there's a lot of bribery in FIFA, but it doesn't, you know, you take a bribe, you don't give a receipt, you got the money, you then go and do what you want. Nobody's going to go to court and say, hey, I gave you a bag of money, and you didn't deliver. There's no commercial transaction that can be tested in the court here. So um, any government that tries it. The Germans did an interesting thing for 2006. In 2000, the German government re realised it. They wanted the World Cup badly. Um, uh, did an arms deal with Saudi, which was done in secret because it wouldn't have flown if people had known about it. And this was selling certain missiles. I can't remember what they were, but selling you know, ground-to-air missiles or whatever things they kill people with to the Saudis, um, and that was done even by a cabinet subcommittee, it didn't go to the full cabinet, and I think that was to try and persuade the Saudi member. But I mean, once you got it, you don't have to uh, say thank you. You have your phone, and then you leave. It's the history of life, isn't it? You don't have to, uh, to sign anything at the end. So no, I think the aid program, I've seen it floated, I don't see that it's actually credible when it comes to the vote. They're not going to go into the vote and say, well, Canada did give a lot of money to you. To, I feel I should give them the games. You've just seen the people I'm talking about. <laughs> Integrity, bargains, agreements. <coughs> no, I don't think so. The government sort of would put aid in that direction. I'm just stupid. They're badly advised. Do it if there's a good reason. The other thing I wanted to ask you about the security, since Munich we saw a security rise in the Olympics, but not to the extent, even up to Atlanta, there wasn't a lot of money being spent on the Olympics. There was one bomb in the community square. But after that, it took off uh, immensely. And of course, after the... Uh, well, 9-11 uh, has had a massive yeah. impact here. I think it's, um, it is a different security game. We can be, we can question an awful lot of things that are going on about it, but there are risks. There are people who seek a suicide bombers if necessary to go and make a dreadful nuisance of themselves in, 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 in public places. Um, that's a good reason for cancelling the games, actually, I think. Or dispersing it around or having one, because this, I think, is the answer to these problems, is you have them in one venue maybe for 20 years and uh, the renewal gets a bit rusty and you can't work with a lick of paint on it. You discuss globally, let's get another venue. But this obscenity of the beautiful, beautiful bird's nest in Beijing, I think it's been used once this year. <laughs> the Athens facility is rusty. And if you saw Athens debt, you'd be, no, national debt, you'd be so glad not to be Greek. Because they just spent stupid money. And I think there was plenty of that going on to get the games. There's some very nice business contracts. I don't know if that's happening in Vancouver. If I were here, 
I would have from the beginning been looking at the contracts granted by the bid committee, to whom, how much, then gone on to the organising committee and remorselessly going through all the contracts. Because you're going to find something somewhere. And that's our job, to go looking for it. That's what people expect from us. And uh, having a, put the boot into the Vancouver media, I should point out that I'm uh, distressed by the London media up the arse of <coughs> Lord Seb Coe, who got his gold medals in Moscow and Los Angeles, but let's move on from that. He was a very good runner, nonetheless. And um, uh, on my website, you, we have this situation in London where the sports news reporters say, this word access, we must better get access, because we can get access to these important people. They'll tell us something extremely unimportant, and then we can put it in the paper, and we've done our job. Mr. Blog, Blog, Blog said yesterday something, but it fills the space between the ads. Um, and we decided at BBC Panorama the other year, 2017 actually, that we, were, we invited Lord Co, who just increased his salary two months ago by 25%. Because he was, I think he's got up from about a quarter of a million pounds a year to 25% more of that, whatever it is. Because he's now having to work full time and not just three days a week on the organising committee. Yeah, you can laugh and you can cry. The bastards get away with it because the sports news reporters have reported it. Not with screaming headlines saying, who is this bum shaking us down at a time when unemployment is rising and we just bought the banks in England. Um, so you have this on the knees, or on the belly reporting, and we're having it in London. So we had a bit of fun at Panorama, which is the Blue Ribbon BBC current affairs show for 50 years has been um, <coughs> the programme. And I'm very glad to present it now and again. I don't even own a type, it doesn't matter anymore with the BBC. And we wanted to ask Co some questions. Actually, it wasn't about the Olympic thing. Um, Co had, uh, had agreed to become head of FIFA's ethics committee. Which, if you think about it for a minute, or you read my book, which is very cheap and brilliantly written, massive <laughs> research, and you'll find it on my website. Please go there, have a look, it's on the front page. You get the first chapter for nothing. I'm not getting a fee for this, so I just thought I'd get the plug in. <laughs> and we wanted to ask Co why nothing had happened at FIFA's Ethics Committee. Nothing. So we went through the normal processes you do in television journalism. You uh, send the email, please, you know, could we arrange a time to an interview? They come back, what do you want to talk about? Fair enough, this is BBC rules, it's all fine with me. Um, you lay out the questionnaire as knowing that has killed any chance of an interview. But you do it because you've got to show later that you were fair. You didn't just hijack them, ambush them. No, we turned out. And I'm still having actually trouble with the panorama editor at the time. and said, come on, it's time to doorstep him. Oh, you know, I'm not sure about this thing. Come on, you know, he's, you know, we have to do this. It's a reasonable interview. He's a public <coughs> figure. We're the major public broadcaster. We've asked politely. And when they give us the, the bums rush, we doorstep them. We do it very professionally, but we do it. And he was still chewing it over when he found that Co had gone off to Zurich, had his legs down with Blatter and put out a press statement about all the hard work he was doing at FIFA Records. Right, he said. And the same night, we, we found out immediately, Co had then gone up to the far north of Scotland, where they have got a few roads, um, but way out of reach, because he would have known that as I was presenting the programme and I have a bit of a legend for doorstepping in England and uh, British television that we'd be coming looking and so we did we got a night flight up uh, to Edinburgh drove for hours four hours sleep at Pitlockery back on the road and we were outside the Glen Nowhere sports centre <laughs> far away from anywhere when Lord Coe arrived and I did my reporter's duty and it was very funny and you can see the clip on my website because he couldn't see the camera we had it on the sticks well back and there's a couple of local news crews paying homage to Lord Coe comes to Stratham. Oh yeah, oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> you know, well out of town. And um, I'm just standing waiting for him to get out of the car. So he can't see. Dickhead thinks I'm on my own. And what he thinks a television reporter is doing without a crew. I mean, you can't work without a crew. If you haven't got somebody with a camera and a sound recorder, you're dead. 
You're a bystander. 